Hey, it's Dr. Joyelle, and welcome to the Women's Health Pro Show, where we have real talk about real women's issues. And a lot of you have tuned in, and we have talked about many things that happen to women after the age of 40, like vaginal dryness. We talked about urinary incontinence. But today, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. Um, you know, there's some women, obviously, after 40, are going through these hormone changes, um, waiting for their periods to stop. And there are also women, 35 and old, older, or over in their 40s, who are actually wanting to get pregnant. And that common question comes up, you know, I'm 40 years old, doctor. What are my chances in regards to pregnancy? And I am one who never, you know, tells a woman that, you know, you should not get pregnant after 40. But I do talk about the risk. And one of those risks, uh, one of those risks is an increased risk of miscarriage. And there are many women who experience miscarriage and they really feel alone. They feel like they are the only ones that are experiencing, experiencing a miscarriage. And it really is very common. Actually, one in five pregnancies can end in first trimester um, preg um, uh, miscarriage. So that that's what I wanted to talk about today because, again, there are so many women who are experiencing this and not really feeling like no one, everyone, no one else is actually experiencing it. And I wanted to share my personal story. Um, I actually was just something in my spirit wanted to share my story, um, especially during the time, um, you know, October is the peri uh, perinatal loss, pregnancy loss month, and something was tugging at my heart to share my story, but I, I hesitated. And I ended up not sharing my story. And then Megan Markle came out with hers. And my husband just out of the blue, um, just said, you know, you should talk about that on your show. So that is why I am here. Um, you know, it is a very vulnerable um, thing to talk about, obviously, for many women, but you know, definitely want to normalize the conversation because it is a difficult conversation, but it's something that a lot of women do experience. So I won't wanted to talk about it. So I am very happy to welcome Janae Hopka-Jones, who is a couples and family therapist, a clinical psychologist, and the author of the Black Angel Mom Guided Journal, which is actually a journal that helps support parents who experiences pregnancy loss. Welcome to the show, Janae. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this. This is wonderful. Your show is great, and I'm happy to be a part of that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming on to the show. So I first wanted to just kind of start with both of us actually sharing our stories. Um, for me, just so um, you know, and the, the rest of the world to know that um, I actually experienced a first trimester miscarriage. Um, actually, I had, I had two kids and um, got pregnant again two years later after my second. And I started experiencing spotting, which a lot of times I tell women, you know, sometimes you can have spotting in the first trimester. And then it started increasing. It became heavier. I started having intense cramping. And then I just knew that, some, you know, something in me told me, like, this is not a good situation. So I actually called one of my friends who's actually one of, the, of my colleagues in my practice. And I had her meet me over on in the triage area on labor and delivery to do a quick ultrasound. And she did the ultrasound for me and basically confirmed what I thought was that I had a um, pregnancy loss, which was, you know, obviously shocking. Um, and the thing is, you know, when I was in the room with her, you know, after hearing it, like I said, I already knew, but just, you know, actually having it confirmed was difficult, but I had to go back out in the triage and labor and delivery and act like nothing happened. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And I went home to tell my husband and essentially curled into a ball and cried for the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. And then I woke up the next morning and, you know, went, went to the office and, you know, didn't tell anyone else and just kind of, you know, kept that to myself and to, you know, another, a couple of other select family members, but didn't, you know, share that with anyone else. And just basically just kind of, you know, uh, make, make it, you know that perception of being the strong strong woman that i can just you know deal with it um and just go through you know the rest of my days um, with this loss but it was difficult you know as a OBGYN, um 
the the the, the thought or the the experience of telling women that they lost a baby, telling a couple that they lost a pregnancy, is the hardest part of my job. And then after I experienced my own loss, it became even harder. And again, I had to put up the front that you know, um, you know. This wasn't triggering for me, and I just had to keep my composure every time. Um, but there was lots of hugs and lots of prayers with my patients. But I always felt that I wanted to do something more, but didn't really have, you know, a, a, a resource to actually give them. So, so that's my story. So, Janae, if you can just tell us a little bit about yours. Okay. Thank you, A, for sharing your story, and I am sorry to hear about your loss as well. Um, so for me, we were um, we had gone through some fertility treatments and we're trying to conceive using IUI, intrauterine insemination, and um, those were unsuccessful. So we ended up starting with in vitro fertilization and we got pregnant with our daughters on the first try of in vitro fertilization. I experienced the loss at uh, 16 weeks, seven days. So it was a second trimester uh, miscarriage. Uh, technically, even though my daughters were born alive, um, they both were born alive and moving, um, but they passed away shortly after that. Uh, they passed generally, or my labor started generally because of PPROM, which is preterm premature rupture of membranes. So one of my daughters, her sac ruptured in utero. And because of their positioning, she, she was baby A at first, which was the baby that's closest to your cervix. Uh, but she moved because her sac ruptured. So, and my other daughter, Aviva, her sac was actually intact, but she was in my cervix and my cervix was open. So there was no way to um, save either one of them. I kind of had to go into labor and um, and have them in that way. So that's quick, kind of quick, <laughs> generally what happened, yeah. Right. Yes. So yes. Sorry. Yes. For your loss also, you. you know, any, any stage of the pregnancy, whether it's early second trimester or even at term or even, you know, after um, right. that loss is definitely devastating. Um, so I wanted to just kind of get your thoughts. And like I said, you know, um, it having to tell a couples, you know, they actually have had a pregnancy loss. Can you give me some feed, uh, resources of what women or any uh, recommendations of what women can do to kind of help with that grief? You know, I send, you know, after giving the, a patient um, that news, they have to go home and actually process this. Right. And so I just wanted to get your thoughts and recommendations of what um, what a woman or what a couple would do actually, you know, after getting this type of news and experience in this. Sure. So there, there are several things that exist. Um, I would say that it really does depend on if you, uh, what type of support you're looking for. So there's always the frontline support that is available of um, support groups. Now, because of COVID right now, people aren't meeting in person. So I think that those might be existing virtually at this point, but typically there are in-person support groups that are for individuals and also for couples. I know my spouse and I attended um, a couples group a few times. So there's that line of, um, of intervention. There are also several social media, honestly, groups that exist that are available for, um, for support for women and for couples as well who have experienced any kind of perinatal loss. So um, do a quick search on Facebook, do a quick search. That's probably the best place to do a search if you're looking for an actual group. If you are just looking for a kind of a page that gives information about these kinds of things, you can do a search on Facebook or Instagram or, or even on Twitter to see what kinds of uh, supports exist. Also, there are several organizations and groups. Sometimes they're local, sometimes they're national, um, but Black Angel Mom is, is the group that I have um, founded and run. So that is an online virtual community that exists exclusively for Black people who have, who have experienced perinatal loss. So there is a, a private Facebook group that's available for that. There's also front-facing uh, Facebook and Instagram pages that folks can follow and get additional information from. And blackangelmom.com is also a blog that has a lot of um, resources that folks can use to help process their loss, really. Uh, fertility in color as well, and fertility in color for men, that is a, they're actually a couple who have experienced perinatal loss several times, and they've created uh, services that help to support, um, that help to support people in that way. 
And um, Sisters and Lost is another great option. I'm not sure if they're more so for couples. I think they're more so for uh, women who have experienced perinatal loss. Um, and they are a faith-based organization. Um, and lastly, the main one that I think of is Return to Zero Hope. Uh, they are an organization that has a, that has a series of resources available for um, for couples, for grandparents individuals, for women, for men, um, there is a, a lot of different resources that they have on their website as well. And they've experienced, the founder uh, experienced perinatal loss. Her, her son died. Um, he, her son was stillborn. I'm sorry. Okay. A different way. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot, lot of resources out there that, that women can um, reach out to, you know, obviously they can, you know, speak to their, you know, healthcare providers and just kind of get, um, you know, their support as well as when they're reaching out to either um, uh, you know, couples groups or support groups and, and reading that regards or just therapy just in general, just for them to process. Um, and I definitely love your blog. And you also mentioned um, uh, there was a, a candle, um, uh, a candle ceremony that you mentioned that you do just to kind mm -hmm. of remember your twins. And I just wanted you to share that and just share the um, importance of, you know, just have some type of remembrance, you know, of, of, of that pregnancy that, that women um, have lost? Sure, yeah, you know, everyone deals with perinatal loss in a different way, right? And people who experience miscarriage in particular, sometimes they are really, um, really impacted by it. And honestly, there are also some people who are not, or at least they don't report being as impacted by it. So it's a really subjective experience and that you have to figure out what makes sense for you and what feels right for you. What I will say is that in my work with um, women and people who have experienced perinatal loss at any stage, some form of a ritual or a memorial or an honoring is usually very, very helpful. So for me, I have, uh, my daughters were born June 7th of 2017. So, and they were born at 9.04 and 9.23 PM. So every Wednesday, it's been three years now, and every Wednesday night I haven't, I missed one because I didn't have matches and I was on vacation. <laughs> so I couldn't light like their candles. But, um, Generally speaking, every Wednesday night, I light their candles at 9.04 and 9.23 p.m. And I have a, um, a little like prayer or, you know, connection message that I send to them or that I speak to them. And um, and it's a it's a short, quick way of connecting with them. And I, of course, also do the wave of light, which occurs. You mentioned that already, Dr. Joya, the um, uh, October is uh, Pale Awareness Month. Pale is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness. Um, the wave of light is October 15th every year at 7 p.m. And that basically is a lighting of the candle at 7 p.m., whatever time zone you are in. And it creates this continuous wave of light for 24 hours, which is really a beautiful way of honoring your your little one. So um, you can light candles on the day that they were born. You can light a candle on the day that they passed if you would like. You can light a candle on the day that you found out you were pregnant if you're not sure when it actually occurred. Um, or you can just light a candle, you know, what I mean, at any right, at right. any point in time to to connect. But ritual is is really really an important part of um, of honoring and connecting with the energy of of the life that you held. You know, if if it's important to you and you value it, then we would celebrate anyone else's birthday, right? right? Or anyone right. else that we that we lost, we would take. Uh, some time to like honor them and memorialize them in some way. So that could be the candle lighting, that could be donating. I had a friend who uh, who had two trees planted in, in honor of my girl. So that's something that happens. My mom donates every year to St. Jude's for them um, in, in their honor. So it could be ways that are big and ways that are small, you know, get a white right. candle. I actually use tea lights because uh, tea lights burn out on their own. Oh, okay. And because the girls lived for a little while, like it kind of symbolizes, you know, that their light just kind of naturally went out. Right. For me. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah that's, that's so, I just thought that was so beautiful. Thank you. Um, so, and you mentioned like, yeah, I mean, every woman or every couple, you know, they grieve differently. And right. I think it's important, you know, for, um, you know, women to know that. And also, you know, all of us, so, you know, I know I personally, when I tell women, you know, when they experience this, you know, the, the, the first thing that they do or we do as women is blame ourselves. 
Mm. And, um, you know, and, and I tell women, like, it, it, nothing that you did, nothing you could have done, you know, this is, you know, this is something that, you know, that happened. A lot of times in the first trimester, over 50% are um, miscarriages are due to some genetic issue. Right. Um, so something, definitely something beyond our control. But it's, it's, you know, we always just, you know, us as caretakers, we have to, you know, find some way that, you know, to blame ourselves, not realizing that this is something that, you know, something that's really beyond your control at times. Right, right. I think that even shows up, and I've been trying to work on that this year, actually, and shifting my language a little bit, even around talking about the girls. We, when we use the term, like, my loss, even, that implies a sense of responsibility, right? Like, that there's something about me that I, like, misplaced or something, and that's that's not what happened. Like, if, if any, pretty much anyone that I have ever encountered or spoken with, if you've had this loss, and you could have done it differently or it could have gone a different way, you would have chose something different. Like the, the child would be here, you know? Right. So you didn't lose anything, but you know, maybe saying that the child passed away or the baby passed away or whatever you wanna, whatever other language you wanna use. But I do wanna encourage folks to even be careful about labeling it that way as loss. It doesn't, or as my loss, it doesn't super trigger me. But when I started to think about semantics, I did think about what that, the implications of saying it that way right. can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Mindset definitely makes a difference. Right. And also the the other thing that really kind of resonated with me when Meghan Markle came out and she made this statement about, you know, her heartbreaking and her husband mm -hmm. kind of, you know, trying to mend her heart but while his heart is breaking also. So I wanted you to speak to the fact that, you know, you know, I know as an OBGYN, you know, t talking to women in the office, you know, the women and their significant other in the office, but a lot of our focus is on the woman. And we really do not, you know, ask even um, about the significant other a lot of times. Yeah. So, you know, it's really, you know, it's not just her, it's actually her and her partner who has, who, who has lost and, mm -hmm. or, you know, basically has experienced this, um, um, this uh this miscarriage so what what do you what do, what are your thoughts in regards to you know including um the significant other or the that partner um in this process i think it's crucial i think it's crucial i think that part of the one of the reasons that folks tend to have so many challenges after experiencing a lot of couples is because there is too often an ignoring of the partner's experience um, there is a centering of the natal parent's experience, but there is an ignoring of the partner's experience. And though there is some um, good basis for that, right? Like the person who physically went through a miscarriage or that kind of a loss, they have a different experience of the loss than the other person. But that doesn't mean that it is, that is necessarily any more or less significant than the other person's experience of grief as well. So... Um, I think I mentioned this to you before, Dr. Joyelle, but I, I definitely have a blog entry that's about, it's titled something like, are they asking about you or are they asking you about her? And because that's a thing that tends to happen when, po when folks do check in with the partner about how things are going post loss, they're still asking the partner about the person who physically had the loss. They're not necessarily asking about how the partner is doing. And, um, you know, postpartum depression and that type of perinatal mood and anxiety disorder, that stuff exists in partners as well. And it also exists for folks who have had a loss, which people tend to forget and they kind of lump that into grief only. And sometimes it's a lot more than just grief. It is specifically centered around the perinatal experience, right? Like the experience that we have during pregnancy. Um, but yeah, it's really, really, really an important thing to check in because there is a, um, there's a desire to caretake of the, the person who did not carry, so the non-natal parent. They obviously want to caretake for the person who has had physically carrying and had the loss, and that is a valid, uh, a valid thing to want to do. But no one, often folks are not taking care of that other person too, and they, the helplessness, right? Like the sense of helplessness. Sorry, I'm hearing like a weird sound feedback. Okay, it went away. <laughs> the sense of helplessness that exists in partners um, is also amplified because they cannot correct or take care of what has occurred. And that's not usually the place that they're in. Um, and just not knowing what to do with it, right? You can't fix it. 
And that's a hard part to sit and witness someone else's pain, knowing that you cannot fix it. There's nothing else that you can do about it to make it better. Um, is you know, it can be it can be a challenge. So it really is important to focus also on both and, not either or. It's not focused right. on natal parent or the partner. It's both and. Right. Definitely agree. You know, having that open communication um, and just asking the question, you know, to both, you know, to each other, are you OK? Yeah. And, you know what you know what we can do together to get through this together. Right. Right. And and being OK with saying I'm not OK, because yes. the best is yes. you're not OK. Right. Most of the ninety nine point nine percent of the time you're not OK and your partner's not OK either. And, no, and you have to be honest about that with each other. And I especially you know, I do a lot of work with folks who have, who have experienced miscarriage in particular, right? Because they categorize perinatal loss differently depending on how far along you were. Right. So people prior to 20 weeks gestation, I work a lot with that population. And um, there is this idea that those types of losses are not as significant, um, which is not true. But right. there's this idea that if you had a miscarriage that you can just get back on a bandwagon and go back to your regular life and just keep like, keep moving forward, like nothing occurred. And for most people that is not valid and that's not how we move through grief and loss because what you're grieving also is the idea of everything that you, especially if you knew you were pregnant and you actually wanted to, to right. keep the child and move forward with that. like. There's a whole story that you've created in your mind about what this child's life is going to be like. Right. So you're grieving the loss of what actually happened and you're grieving the loss of everything else that you thought was going to happen. So that's what ends up coming up at these anniversaries around this time of year, right? Like around the holidays, they're like, oh, most a lot of folks are wondering or thinking about how old that kid would have been, right? Or what else right. they would have been doing with that child. And that's, um, that's a, it's a hurt piece, honestly. Right. Yes, yes, I totally agree. I mean, to be fully transparent, just, you know, in my position as the OB, um, before my, my experience, even before having kids, I always, you know, kind of wondered if, you know, whether it was, in the, you know, early on the pregnancy versus later on the pregnancy, if that experience of loss was any different. And then, you know, as I experienced my own loss, which was very early, I was just as devastated, like, oh my gosh, like you said, you just have these plans, you know, I've already had two kids and now I'm pregnant again. And, but then, and then I, you know, lost the pregnancy. It was just, you know, something that I just wasn't expecting. Like I wasn't expecting the devastation, to be honest. I'm like, right. oh, you know, it was so early, but right. you know, like you said, it's just, you know, it just, it, it matters just as much as, you know, if it's happening in the later on in the pregnancy. Absolutely. And there are physiological things that go along with it. I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail because I don't know how much <laughs> we can say on the show. But I mean, there's, right. there are things that happen when you miscarry, um, including cramping and bleeding. And no, it's not like a period. That's right. not what, you know what I mean? That's not what it is. So that, that physical trauma often that folks go through is, all, is important to address it. And just because people on the outside couldn't tell that you were pregnant, doesn't right. mean that your body didn't know it was pregnant, you know what I mean? And that it reacts, it responds. Right. And that is a, a, it can be a really traumatic uh, time for a lot of folks. Right, most so, of Yeah. Definitely. All right, but thank you so much, Janae. Can you tell You're people welcome. where they can find you um, if they wanted to read your, like I said, your blog is great. So I really recommend uh, um, people um, read her blog. Can you tell people where to find you? Sure, so the blog is blackangelmom.com. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that is a, a website. So you can just search that. It has uh, there are some things that you can um, purchase on there if you want to. But there also is just a blog, and it has several different categories of of topics. Some stuff is funny. Some stuff is poetry. Some stuff is you know seven gems. Is one that I have called, have called seven gems that just goes through seven things in any given circumstances that, that you can take away and take with you to pass on to helping professionals or family or friends and whatnot. Um, so that's that Black Angel Mom, uh, I think it's Black Angel Mom one on, on Twitter and Black Angel Mom like with an underscore in between each word on Instagram. Um, and you can just search Black Angel Mom on Facebook. Uh, the group, the private or the private Facebook group can be accessed through the blackangelmom.com website. There's a, an icon, so you can just click there and it'll um, take you to the Facebook page to request to join the group. 
Um, and then my therapy page is jhjtherapy.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the show and sharing thank your you. story and being vulnerable with that. Thank and you. we'll um, get you back on the show sometime. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for having me. Yes, yes. That's so, great. you know, I think we both want everyone to know that, you know, miscarriage is a common thing. Um, and, you know, even though you are, if you experience a miscarriage, it's something that you are not alone with. Um, and it is okay to not be okay. And don't be afraid to, you know, ask for help if you need to. And, as, and also just including your partner through the process. So that is all that we have. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the Women's Health Pro Show, where we have real talk about real women's issues.